antagonizing or organizing here at the Progressive Caucus Center Strategy Summit in Baltimore. We spent a day talking to progressive Democrats and their friends about what comes next. It's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Joining me, two members of two parties, the Democratic Party and the Labour Party in the United Kingdom. Representative Rahul Grijalva has been a long-time, 10-year co-chair of the Progressive Caucus of the Democrats in Congress. He represents a southern district in Arizona. Diane Abbott is the member of Parliament for Hackney North and Stoke Newington. She's also in the leadership of the Labour Party and has been working inside and outside the Labour Party for progressive change with new party leader Jeremy Corbyn for over 30 years. Representative Grijalva, member of Parliament, Diane Abbott, welcome to the program. Glad to have you. Why don't I start by asking you to um, tell each other a little bit about the people and the places you represent. My family came to this country from the Caribbean in the 1960s. They were ordinary working people. My mother was a nurse and my father worked in a factory. And I've always considered myself, whether as an activist or as a member of parliament, as a voice for the voiceless, including migrants. Because as they say in Hackney, we have so many different groups of migrants. I represent a very diverse but inner city urban district. It was always basically a very poor area, but in recent years there's been this element of gentrification. Um, I've represented it for 30 years, so I've seen the changes. <laughs> I've seen the changes. Yeah, I represent southern Arizona, a district with some severe economic challenges in terms of uh, unemployment income, uh, education attainment. It's a diverse district, uh, Latino, primarily Mexican, a large concentration of Native American, and big swaths of rural America in the middle of all of it. I'm a first generation American. My, my parents came to this country from Mexico. And having grown up in those borderlands and having my whole life spent there, I have increased appreciation for what we mean to the rest of the nation. And I think it's a little microcosm of what this country is starting to look like all over the place. Some of the issues facing my people, my constituents at the moment, are, is worklessness, a kind of international push against immigrants and yes. the children of immigrants, which has um, poisoned the political atmosphere. That's partly why we have that vote on Brexit. We've seen a rise in violence against people of colour and migrants on the street. And of course, that's all reinforced by the presence of Trump across the Atlantic. Yes. And it was disturbing for some of us to see our Prime Minister, Theresa May, apparently holding hands with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. That's not what progressives in the UK want to see. The Labour Party was set up by the Labour movement. So it's always had an integral relationship with the Labour movement. But under Tony Blair, the Labour Party moved to a more corporate position, a more corporate understanding. And the high point of that, or the low point, if you want to say it like that, was the way Tony Blair supported George W. Bush over the Iraq yes. war. And very many people actually left the Labour Party over that because they felt so strongly about that. We never debated it properly as a party. When my colleague, the current leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, ran, I always knew he would do better because I knew there was the support there amongst grassroots Labour Party, people for progressive politics. But the key to Jeremy winning was a democratic overhaul of the party. You can't have progressive politics in a political party unless the party itself is open and democratic. And that was the first step. So when you hear that story, uh, Raul, what do you think? The aberration, which is Trump and Trumpism, has, uh, I think, uh, shook the foundation of, of many people. The parallels about uh, making immigrants and migrants the, the, the wedge issue politically in, in order to sustain uh, themselves in power. 
what's happened in the last four or five years, and, and it's, for me it's been a, a very important development, is that suddenly those issues that we care about have become mainstream. Issues of wages and, and equity and issues of this concentration of power, issues of inequality, gender, uh, LBGTQ, and, and the young people suddenly feeling an insecurity about what their future is going to be about. I think one of the things which helped Jeremy to win leadership of the Labour Party and then to do very well in the general election, we gained 30 votes, was the concerns of young people. You can't have much confidence in capitalism if you don't have any capital, basically. And young people voted for the Labour Party last year in unprecedented numbers. And that was good for us, but it's also good for young people because people won't be able to ignore them and their concerns in the future. Raul, from the outside, it looks as if your project has been to try to change the Democratic Party from the inside. How, how are you doing? I really believe that, that this is a force. It's not only an electoral force, but the policy-wise, we're a force. And, that, and that's been a sea change. We had the majority of our caucus that supported the Progressive Caucus's budget. That's major. And people aren't stuck in their issue silos to the point that they don't understand that they're connected to this other side. Advocates for, and organizers around immigrant issues understand that there's a connection to environmental issues, understand that there's a connection to labor issues. What we need is this outside pressure that gives us legitimacy inside. Well, I think you can change parties from the inside, and that's what the British experience has shown. First of all, we had to democratize the party to make it possible for a progressive to become leader. And what we found, running on the most democratic agenda, a Labour Party has campaigned on since 1945, is people want things to change. Ordinary people, they may not consider themselves progressive exactly, but they know that the status quo isn't working for them and they're very open to change. But we still have a real challenge in this country, Raul. You have the DCCC actively working to undermine progressive candidates. Why, why are things so different? That whole apparatus is driven by money. As Ms. Abbott just said, that you know, grassroots people, people that feel a frustration, are looking for boldness, answers, hopeful leadership. You saw it during the convention, the Sanders and, and, and Clinton, where it was predestined because of the way, the lack of democratic one person, one vote kind of a situation with the delegates there. I think we can still reform our party and bring it back to its roots, uh, but I think we're gonna have to have a presence many times outside that structure, because that structure is so embedded right now that it's gonna take this election and maybe one more to reform it the way it should be. I, if I may miss heaven. The parallel, as, as, as we're seeing in this country and the Trump whole issue on immigration, immigrants, the bane of all our societal problems here in the United States, according to them, and you see some of those parallels too as you, as you look at Europe and you look at Great Britain. And I, I wonder, my question is, do you, do, you, do you see what I see or is it? I think there are definitely parallels. I think the way, because, you know, post the crash, a lot of ordinary people's wages have either, um, you know, not gone up or actually gone down and people have lost their jobs and there's been a collapse of the blue collar jobs in Britain, coal, steel, manufacturing. And so people look for a scapegoat and the scapegoat is migrants. And it suits, um, you know, the conservatives and big business and the, the right wing media to say, yes, those immigrants are the cause of all your problems. It's too easy. And what we found was when you went to party members and talked about this immigration issue, they were willing to listen. But the people that ran the party before thought that it was only by triangulating on immigration and do you know what I mean backing away from it as an issue that you can move forward. Yeah. But we found it different. You have to speak to voters. You have to explain, not just use immigrants as a scapegoat. And and that's the step we need to take uh, because uh, our party, my party, ran away from the issue of immigration for three elections in a row yeah. and we've paid the price. How does Jeremy Corbyn, how do you and how does the Labour Party under your leadership respond to, for example, terrorist attacks? Both Jeremy and I have been very clear that we didn't support the two Iraq wars. I, we think that the intervention in Afghanistan needs to be wound up because it's not achieving 
what it's supposed to achieve. In fact, it's made things worse. That of course, terrorism is a terrible thing. And, but you cannot escape the notion that it's a lot of these military interventions overseas that have created the chaos which helps terrorism to grow. There's no excuse for terrorism. I think we have to be a lot more thoughtful about overseas interventions. We can, we've contributed in the past to the breeding of this disease. The focal point of, an, of a policy that then has the corresponding effect of, on immigrants, corresponding effect on civil liberties, corresponding effect on privacy. That's where the conflict is right now in this country as to the intrusion beyond the need to secure and keep people safe. Is this a third rail in, the US, in US politics? I mean, will we ever have a leader of the Democratic Party who dares to carve out and speak publicly positions like the ones Diane's expressing? I'm older now, but I think in my lifetime, the, the, the level of boldness is, and honesty has gone up tremendously in this country. We'll see a lot more of it because uh, not only is it necessary and good, it's winning. A thing that runs through this country, as you well know, they love winners. And I'd like to see stronger links between progressives in Iraq and progressives in the UK, not least because, you know, when you have Trump in the US, that's scary for everybody internationally, and we want to work with people. I think the dialogue with our partners and allies outside this country is very necessary because this aberration can't be just dealt with in isolation. Thank you both for joining us here on The Laura Flanders Show. We've got much more to come from the Progressive Caucus Center Strategy Summit here in Baltimore 2018. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show. Stay tuned. For all of my time in the Labour Party, which is nearly 40 years now, particularly in the Blair years, Party members were told that Labour could not win on a socialist programme. It was such a piece of received wisdom that anyone who spoke about having some elements of a socialist programme in our platform was laughed to scorn. But this time, last year, we had an emphatically left-wing programme. So, for instance, in our program, we said we were going to nationalise the railways, bring them back into public ownership. We said we were going to scrap tuition fees for college students. And we said we were going to put up tax on higher earners. Now, this was the kind of thing that many of us had been told for years you would be crazy to put in your platform. But the truth is, to the astonishment of uh, commentators and some Labour MPs, our domestic agenda proved to be very popular. What's your response to the Labour Party model? And will this party ever talk differently about length, about things like capitalism and socialism? Well, we're not going to be talking about socialism. Uh, we're talking about improving capitalism so that it really works for people returning to a time when capitalism was about stakeholders, about employees, about the community at large, about uh, customers, not just about uh, shareholders. So we, we, are, we are a capitalist system, and uh, I get criticized for saying that, but we are. Well, we do believe we have a strong message. Our message is a better deal, better jobs, better wages, better future. With us from the Democratic Progressive Caucus, co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, is Mark Pocan, Eduardo Mora, is with the Spanish organization Podemos. And my first question to you, Eduardo, is how do you describe what Podemos is? We launched Podemos in 2014. Um, there was a huge wave of discontent in Spain coming from 2011, and we had to make a decision, and we decided to create a political party to stand in election. What was your entryway into working with Podemos? I was part of the student movement in, when I was in, in college, 
And then I, I got very interested in, in politics uh, at the grassroots level. And when the, the time came and when the opportunity arose, uh, I, I decided to, to found this party. I, I'm one of the, one of the co-founders of, of Podemos. And how about you, Mark? I don't think I've ever asked you how you got involved in political work. Oh, I think it was my dad. He was uh, in local government, so uh, I was doing doors at eight. <laughs> so, knocking uh, on them. Yeah, knocking on them, walking around with my dad, and uh, uh, it goes back a little ways, too. Talk a bit, you first, um, Mark, about your experience of going from, um, well, at the one at the one level, a state activist and a state representative to being in Washington. It's been a year since we've checked in with you about that. How is it? Yeah, well, I mean, in what a year to do it, right? A year of Donald Trump is... Um, like seven years. It's like dog years, right, for everybody having to endure this much uh, activity. But it's been great for the movement because clearly, you know, people around the country uh, are upset with what's going on. The energy is all on the progressive movement. It's on our side. So it's just a matter of making sure that, you know, the uh, leaders are following the people. Uh, and if we do that, I think, you know, we're going to be in good place this fall to try to change things around. A lot of people realized Staying home in 2016 wasn't a good idea, uh, and now uh, it's the progressive movement where the energy's at, and I think you know we're well poised to, uh, when we get some control, to actually advance positive legislation instead of just fighting everything we've had to fight with Donald Trump. Mm. And, and, and you, Eduardo, in terms of what you're grappling with, how has it changed over the last few years? Between 2011 and 2015, there was um, a very progressive agenda in Spain, in, in Southern Europe, and we took advantage of that, both in the streets and uh, in the ballot box. But um, since 2015, uh, there's been two, let's say, up and down years with uh, more conservative issues on the agenda. 2018, this year, is, is kind of a crossroads year for us. It's the, on one side the feminist movement, very powerful in Spain. I think it's turning things around. And also uh, people who have problems with their retirement plans. In Spain, most people have uh, government-funded retirement plans. And they haven't have a raise in their income in the last six years. And now they are just facing a huge problem because inflation is, is going up. Well, what sort of changes have you had to make internally to address those challenges? We had a few internal debates. What do we do? Do we try to convince people um, of uh, breaking with the past, breaking with the status quo? Or do we try to provide them with new progressive certainties? This is kind of a debate. In, in a very developed country, like the US, like Spain, like, like France, like any European country, you need people to imagine themselves um, having a job, raising their children in a country basically ruled by your progressive uh, policies. It's very important to provide people with certainties, different alternative certainties. And I think this internal debate was very useful, hard, of course, as any internal debate, but uh, very useful, and I hope it makes us stronger. So how are we doing on the uh, certainty, the alternative certainties on the democratic front? Healthcare in this country right now is sort of a mess, uh, and it's getting messier uh, because of the Trump administration. Can we sell the well, what if we were like, you know, pretty much every other industrialized uh, peer country and had health care for our citizens? Wouldn't that be a better system? And I think that's um, part of our challenge is to make sure that people can really understand that there is that alternative. It's not just, you know, death of a thousand cuts to health care by Donald Trump and, you know, 83 percent of the money of the tax bill in 10 years going to the top one percent that the other 99 percent of us matter. There have been a lot of movement moments in the United States that have felt like great solidarity moments. Internally, how does the Democratic Party actually consider those moments? No, it's a great point. So I, I used to have a bumper sticker that I'm going to put on my car again because I keep saying it, which is, if the people lead, eventually the leaders will follow. And I think this is what's happening in all these special elections. There are 39 state legislative seats since Donald Trump got elected that have flipped from Republican to Democrat and only four the other direction. So clearly, um, there's a movement. And so I think we're at a point where, again, people are ahead of us. Whether or not the Democratic Party catches up to where they are at and convinces them to ride with us on this ride uh, is the real question. But so far, I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing through these electoral successes. And you being here at this gathering, Eduardo, what are you seeing? What's of interest to you of what's going on here among the progressive Democrats? Well, many things. Many things because, um, Firstly, um, what the Trump administration is doing uh, has had a great impact upon the rest of the world. 
I mean, it's changing the European agenda as well. Um, How so? For instance, we've had this CETA voting um, in Congress in, in Spain uh, three months ago, and you know this this uh, trade agreement with Canada is um, of, uh, of paramount importance uh, for us because it changes the way society works. It provides uh, big companies with um, actually privatized courts. When you get to this debate in a country like Spain, quite far from the US, you get the feeling that being against CETA means uh, Trump being against TTIP. So you are in favor of a closed society, you are against trade. And you can't be for trade but against these trade agreements anymore. And this is making things harder for us. So we feel for, for you. We are sympathetic to, your, to the fight you're putting up, but we also need you to, to change the agenda with Trump in office. Well, we need it now because it's, it's, it's having a great impact. And, and how is the party dealing with bringing back into the fold uh, Trump voters without, with, with a different kind of message than his? So first of all, he won Wisconsin uh, by 23,000 votes because of the issue of trade. On the top line, what he said resonated with a lot of people. The real problem is his trade plan is based on xenophobia. It's not based on labor standards or the ISDS provisions or things that I think we care about as a people. His are just based on he doesn't like foreigners, it's America first. Occasionally he can do something mm. that looks correct even though it's for all the wrong reasons and then we have to explain to people why the, the reasoning still is wrong and what we've got to do to actually have a fair trade policy that respects the labor and environmental standards and keeps the sovereignty through the courts uh, so that you can you know protect yourself against a corporation otherwise that has a super judicial process uh, but it is tricky it's difficult we need to make sure that people really understand that I think they get it in their gut um, but we have to just really make sure we're conveying those alternative progressive policies that show uh, that you can have family supporting policies that put money in your pocket and you can have opportunity for your kids and if we do that we have far more alternatives that actually work. Eduardo, at what point did you all decide to start a new party and not just try to push the one that you had? In Spain we were used to have this um, um, two-party system, very strong party system, with other parties around like supporting them, either conservative or, or left-wing. But we, we, had the, we had the conservative party and the socialist party. Um, the thing is that with um, the economic crisis, with the moral crisis that came along with the economic crisis, and also with the social change that uh, Spain was going through, um, we thought that this uh, two-party system was, uh, had fallen in such a disrepute that uh, there was a, a, like a crack in the system. We thought there was a, a regime crisis, let's say. And we decided to, to take advantage of this crack and kind of you know, get in by creating this, this party. And now we are polling at 2021 and we have won eight mayoral races in, in Spain including Madrid and, and Barcelona, which we hope to keep in 2019. What was the final thing that was the sort of straw that broke the camel's back for you when you talk about the, the rottenness, the moral crisis? What was it? The combination between corruption on one side, uh, a huge, very deep social crisis, and the Indignados movement in 2011. What we certainly see is the influence of these big corporations and big special interests who use money through campaigns, essentially. Now, what's interesting is in the past, often we've seen on campaign finance reform, people said they're, they understand that a corporation's gonna lobby for their best interest, which is to make a profit. But most recent polling we've seen, it's really changed. People understand that the special interest influence in Washington, especially under someone like Donald Trump, is almost what they would call corrupt. And we're getting to a point where now you can run against pharmaceutical companies and you can run for antitrust reform and you can run on these concepts that weren't really conversations we had even a couple years ago in this country. And is there ever a litmus test for you in this moment with all this organizing, with this energy, with these candidates coming up, is there a litmus test on the democratic establishment beyond which you might go into a place like the one that Eduardo found himself in. You know, we've seen some um, third party efforts, which are always difficult, right? Especially when there's mm -hmm. two established parties and we've seen some tries and we've never really seen that happen. Our 
argument that I have, and you know, we try to put it out there all the time, is people should join the party and take over their local parties and take over the, the Democratic Party. So if they're not happy with uh, how it works in their local community or their state, just then take it over. And there are so many people who are active right now. We had that uh, Women's March right after Donald Trump got elected. And in Madison, Wisconsin in January, which it can be very cold, we had nearly 100,000 people come out. These are the movements we're seeing right now. And uh, I think it's easier to channel it into the existing structure. And if we do that, come November, if we take the majority, we're positioned to put those policies forward. But there isn't a beyond the pale thing that the Democratic establishment would do that would just exasperate. In fact, just the opposite right now. The Democratic Party is actually, everyone wants to be more progressive. You know, suddenly everyone wants to be in our movement. We just have to make sure that uh, we control the movement. We're listening to the people because that's the most important. And uh, right now I feel very uh, positive about it. Great talking with you. you. You can find out more about all of this work at our website. That's lauraflanders.com. Mark Pocan. Eduardo Mora, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.